Okay, uh, moving right along, uh, our second speaker, uh, Peter uh, Kolchiski. Um, I've known Peter only by name, and I met him a couple of weeks ago, so I'm pleased that um, I'll get to hear more of what he has to say, uh, because what I know of him is, um, yeah, it's all good. Uh, uh, Peter is, uh, has worked with the Indigenous People's Solidarity Movement. He's a professor uh, Department of Native <coughs> Studies at the University of Manitoba. And he's in, been involved with Grassy Narrows and a whole bunch of other things that I don't, I don't know yet. Uh, but I'm looking forward to hearing Peter. So Peter, would you please uh, come and, uh, yeah. And you can adjust this thing. All right, it's fine. <laughs> um, it looks good. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right, real lips. Hey, 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 thank you. Um, uh, well, uh, one thing I'll say about myself is I'm non-Aboriginal, but I went to um, uh, a residential school in northern Manitoba, Frontier Collegiate in Cranberry Portage, which was all, one of the last vestiges of the historic residential school that you know about. By the time I went there, it was government run. But four years there was sort of what convinced me to do the work that I do in Aboriginal politics, which I've been doing you know, well, uh, from graduate school on, but certainly I can say like for the last 30 years I've been working in mid and far northern Aboriginal communities. And so uh, uh, working a lot around uh, land issues and to a certain extent on treaty issues. Um, I don't have a lot of time, I want to make sure that Chippity gets, the next speaker gets her due. Very powerful speaker, and I think will say some important things. I, I want to give you kind of the boring, dry, legal, historical facts around treaties and convey as much of that as I can in like about 15 minutes or talking as fast as I possibly can, but don't worry because I'm a very fast talker. <laughs> I'm sure every little bit that I would want to say, but I can teach whole courses on the historic treaties or on current treaties, and I should say treaty negotiations are still proceeding in various parts of the country, so um, there's a lot of material there for me to cover. We normally begin with, we can begin earlier, but I'll, I'll begin with 1763. The Royal Proclamation of 1763 is considered the Treaty of Treaties. That was a document that the, the, the British government um, proclaimed after the end of the Seven Years' War, or as it's called in the United States, the French and Indian War. That was the war that determined that English would be our language for most of North America rather than French. It's where the British defeated the French, both in Europe and in the Americas. So um, the war was over in the Americas by 1760, the, the Battle of Blunders on the Plains of Abraham. Um, but it took a while for it to be finished in Europe. When it was done, they had set up um, uh, military governments in, in what was then New France, now Quebec, for example, and in the new British possessions. So they had to transfer the, the military governments to civilian governments, kind of like when the Americans invaded Iraq. They had first a military government, and then they have to turn it over to civilian authorities. So half of the Royal Proclamation is about establishing the, the civilian governments in the new British possessions in the Americas. The other half of it deals with Aboriginal rights. The reason why the other half of it deals with Aboriginal rights is because the British had just fought a long war. At around that time, Pontiac, one of the great Anishinaabek leader, had this idea, let's drive all the Europeans back into the ocean where they came from. Really great idea, and he united a lot of people to do that, and if he hadn't been assassinated, might have been able to you know, start a very serious Aboriginal resistance. As it was, it was a significant Aboriginal resistance that he led. Um, uh, the British realized, A, they, didn't, they couldn't afford to fight another war, and a guerrilla warfare fought with Aboriginal people would be very expensive, very time consuming, and who knows whether they would win or not. They decided, and they were lobbied uh, uh, on the question, they decided the better way is to recognize Aboriginal land rights, make sure that colonial governors don't have the power to take to negotiate even land away from Aboriginal people, that the highest level of government should negotiate around legal issues. They were concerned that one of the reasons so many Aboriginal people joined Pontiac was that they would, you know, someone would come get their signature on a piece of paper for anything and then come back and say, this piece of paper is, is signing away your land rights. So the Royal Proclamation said, Aboriginal land can only be surrendered if a, if a First Nation wants to surrender it, only to the highest authority. It has to be a, a surrendered in front of all of the assembled Aboriginal people with due process and for a consideration. 
So uh, that's why the, seven, the, the Royal Proclamation of 1763 is re-enshrined in the Canadian Constitution Act of 1982 and is cited in every Aboriginal land rights case that's ever been fought in the Canadian courts and many of them that have been fought in the American courts. And we consider it the Treaty of Treaties from the British or from the English jurisprudential side or the English law side. It's the document that says uh, we recognize Aboriginal title and uh, if they're prepared to surrender it, they have to get a fair price and uh, surrender it with due process. There's, uh, from the Haudenosaunee side especially, there's the notion of the Turo Wampum and even earlier as well as later treaties of in Haudenosaunee cultural forms, uh, which have only been partly been recognized by the courts and uh, uh, I'm not the person to speak about those. For those, you go to a Haudenosaunee elder and they can speak at great length about the Turo Wampum and the many other uh, treaties that were signed by William Johnson, one of the sponsors of the Royal Proclamation. I think in a sense, uh, Johnson and other people tried to end the English language language enshrine those principles in the Royal Proclamation. All right. Um, so uh, there were some earlier treaties, which we call peace and friendship treaties. And then there were a set of treaties that were uh, after the American Revolution, when the Aboriginal loyalists to the British Crown fled to Canada. They needed land for them. So there were what we call cash for land deals that were signed with the Mississaugas in the checkwork of treaties in Southern Ontario. I only mention this because this is the, that patchwork of treaties led to some unsurrendered land. That's why there's a land dispute at Caledonia that's been in the news and has been very important. It goes all the way back to those times. The treaties that we know about and that we recognize, the numbered treaties, were based on um, uh, the William Robinson treaties from the 1850s. So William Robinson was charged with the task of getting Aboriginal people around Lake Superior and Lake Huron to surrender their title for la to land so that the, the colonies could, uh, the British North American colonies could expand. Then they were fighting the battle with the United States, wanting to spread further west faster than the United States was. William Robinson read the Royal Proclamation and decided that just giving a real estate transaction wouldn't work. So that the features we see in the numbered treaties that followed were kind of used by him. The idea of giving money every year, annuity payments, $3 a year, the idea of setting up reserve lands. A lot of the elements that we see in the numbered treaties were first established in 1850. Uh, then when Canada became Canada in 1867, Indians and lands reserved for Indians were made a federal responsibility, carrying on the Royal Proclamation idea that the highest level of government should be involved in Aboriginal affairs. Uh, the federal government then purchased uh, Rupert's land off of the Hudson's Bay Company, and as soon as Aboriginal people heard about that, they say, you know, you're saying you bought this land, you bought off the Hudson's Bay Company, well, they never owned it in the first place. We owned it in the first place. So the, the federal government realized, yes, they needed to deal with Aboriginal people and with Métis. So they sent out uh, uh, William Morris, who established uh, treaty commissions, and they negotiated treaties one and two. Now, here's a little trick I teach all my students. It's easy to remember the dates of the first seven numbered treaties, because they follow the appropriate date in the 1870s. So uh, both treaty number one and two were in 1871, but then treaty three is 1873, treaty four is 1874, treaty five, when do you think? 1875. You guys are so smart, I don't feel like I really need to say anything anymore. Tre uh, treaty six was 1876, treaty seven was 1877. Now all of those involved a clause that said the First Nation cedes, release, and surrenders all lands, it says lands only, it doesn't say waters, uh, within a defined area. And in exchange for that, the First Nation was told you can practice your usual avocations of hunting, fishing, uh, trapping, and fishing on, on, on Crown lands. You can have an annuity payment. You can have reserve lands guaranteed to you, uh, so much you know, per family of five. Um, uh, you will promise to keep the peace and help us um, make sure that lawbreakers keep the peace. Uh, and then there were some promises around education. Treaty 6, there was a promise around health care. Um, uh, and there, there are slight differences between those treaties, but the significant thing about the first seven treaties is they were genuinely negotiated, particularly Treaty 3 in northwestern Ontario and a part of Manitoba. There were very hard negotiations in Treaty 3. They raised the annuity rates from $3 a year to $5 a year. They expanded the amount of land given from 160 acres per family of five to 640 acres per family of five, so that uh, the details were changed. The Treaty 3 chiefs were quite tough negotiators. And, uh, you know, and realized they had a good bargaining position. 
Now, um, after the first seven treaties, the next treaties, Treaty 8, 9, 10, and 11, which were the last of the numbered treaties, took a different pattern. They're called the Northern Treaties, and so they're Northern Ontario, Northern Saskatchewan, and Alberta, the Northwest Territories. In those treaties, the treaty commissioners carried a document with them, and their job was to get the First Nations people to sign the document. Right? It was just a sign on the dotted line kind of thing. Um, and so they weren't there to actually negotiate. They were there to collect signatures, get a land surrender, and make cash payments. But they made speeches, and actually, as those treaties go along, I know from some work on Treaty 9, and work that I myself have done, and a lot of work's been done on Treaty 11. So Treaty 11 in the Northwest Territories with the Dene, who I work with, for example, uh, I worked with a great elder named Paul Wright who passed away about 10 years ago. He was a nephew of Albert Wright. Albert Wright is on Treaty 11 as having signed with an ex. Well, Paul knew that his uncle had been to residential school in Montreal in the, some, in the 1914, 1915. And his uncle was very proud of the fact that he could write his name. There's no way he would have signed the treaty with an ex. In fact, on Treaty 11, all the exes look exactly the same. And the reason why is because all of the X's were made by the clerk. The Aboriginal signatories to the treaty just touched the pen to show that they agreed with their mark being made on the treaty. So in the case of Treaty 11, it was basically proven that you know, reserves weren't set up uh, as a result of the treaty because the First Nation thought that they'd never surrendered their land. They had agreed to share their land. And I suspect in many of the treaties, in fact, the surrender clauses were probably not adequately translated and or, uh, you know, in the northern treaties may not have been read out at all. People weren't thinking they were surrendering their land. People believed that they were sharing their land. They were getting material help, economic help that they needed in exchange for welcoming the newcomers and sharing the land peacefully. I think that that's the treaty bargain that most treaty signatories were making when they signed the treaty. And, um, you know, the, the federal government lawyers from the earliest times on took a narrow, literal interpretation of the treaties. Now, God, I could go on about this at length, so let me keep an eye on the time. That's good, I have a little bit more time. Uh, 1921, basically after 1921 and Treaty 11, the federal government, by then, Aboriginal people didn't pose a military threat. So except for the Williams Treaty of 1923, that was sort of a cleanup of some of the problems of the Mississauga Treaties that had been pushed for for 10 years by my friends, uh, the ancestors of people around Curve Lake. I used to teach at Trent University near there. There was a kind of hiatus. Well, first of all, from 1927, Aboriginal people between 1927 and 1951, because of an amendment to the Indian Act, could not come forward with a, with a treaty or a land rights claim. They couldn't hire a lawyer, basically. They were banned by law from hiring people to, to uh, advance their grievances. So there's a period 1927 to 1951 when Aboriginal people, and you know, the main, one of the main Aboriginal activists at the time, Fred Loft, I did research on him personally, he was 73 years old. They were threatening to throw him in jail in the 1930s. The only thing that kept him out of jail, he was trying to organize a National League of Indians. The only thing that kept him out of jail as an elder was the fact that he died before they could actually bring him to court. So it, it was very serious business. And up till 1951, then you couldn't you know, fight for your land rights. After 1951, there's a period where people don't even realize there's a change to the Indian Act. Then by the late 50s, the Nishka realize they can start fighting for their land rights. They start fighting for their land rights. Eventually, they hire lawyers. Thomas Berger is one of those lawyers. They, they go through the lower courts. They go through the middle courts. They reach the Supreme Court of Canada. Their case is heard. Finally, in 1973, the Supreme Court of Canada renders a decision in the Calder case, named after Frank Calder, one of the Nishka chiefs. And six of the seven judges said Aboriginal title is a, is a legal fact in Canada. We can't ignore the fact that Aboriginal title exists. Three of the judges said the Niska Aboriginal title had been arbitrarily wiped away by the British Columbia government. Three of the judges, three of the judges said the Niska Aboriginal title could not have been wiped away by the British Columbia government. It could only be wiped away with their consent, so it's still intact. Three to three. The decision was hanging on a thread. The fourth judge said they never filed a caveat, the seventh judge said they never filed a caveat with the British Columbia government. Uh, therefore, they didn't follow the proper procedure in bringing their claim. Therefore, regrettably, we can't pronounce on the substance of the case their claim has to fail. So the Calder case technically was a loss for the Nishka, but it woke up the federal government. Pierre Trudeau said famously, well, uh, perhaps you had more Aboriginal rights than we thought we had when we did the white paper. 
That's my best Trudeau imitation. I'm sorry. So, Trudeau was no friend of the Aboriginal peoples. I was there fighting him way back in the 70s when he was still in power. So everyone likes to remember him with these rose-colored glasses now. I never liked him, never will like him, and he was never good to Aboriginal peoples, I'll tell you that. Anyways, um, uh, the Calder case forced the federal government to restart the treaty process. That's why you start seeing modern land claims, which were first called comprehensive claims, but are now called modern treaties. So my friends in the Satu in the Northwest Territories have a Satu treaty. Um, uh, the Niska now finally have a treaty. Uh, Gwich'in have a treaty. Uh, so there are various, uh, particularly in BC, there's a lot of unfinished Aboriginal title land business. So negotiating treaties is huge business in the province of British Columbia today. Now the one reason why, one of the reasons why I mentioned that is in the treaties they negotiate today, where they have a land surrender clause, it's changed slightly, but basically the same. It said they got rid of the word surrender. So it said, cede, release, and convey all rights, titles, and interests, if any, to all lands and waters in Canada. So two significant differences there. One, they say in Canada, so they encapsulate any claim you might make anywhere within Canada. Because what they're finding is that some of the First Nations, for example, Skownen. Skownen is at the edge of Treaty 2, but it's, they traditionally hunted and trapped not just one mile north of the community, but much further north. So that some of that land was surrendered by Treaty 5, but never surrendered by Skownen, who had an overlapping claim to that territory. And their land surrender just says you surrender you know, following this river. It doesn't say any lands and waters within Canada. Second thing is all the number treaties just surrender rights and title to land. Nothing is said about water, right? Whereas the Satu Treaty says surrender all rights, titles, and interests, if any, to lands and water anywhere within Canada forever to Her Majesty and Right of Canada. So I've been making the argument that uh, in the numbered treaties, um, uh, they, uh, only land rights have been surrendered. In fact, all of the numbered treaties still include water rights. Uh, so two other quick points that I want to get across. One is that in terms of how we interpret the treaties, there have been two interpretations. The federal government offers what we call a literal interpretation. If it says $5 a year, we'll give them $5 a year. You know, whatever it says, if it says we must build a schoolhouse and maintain a schoolhouse, then our obligation is to build and maintain a schoolhouse. That's it. If we're providing funding for other, for you know, a school gym or for post-secondary education, that's out of generosity. That's not an acknowledgment of the treaty, says the federal government. The First Nations have said there's a spirit of the treaty. If you promised a schoolhouse, what you were really promising was as much education as we needed to succeed in society. Our elders, you know, who weren't stupid people back in those days, wouldn't have surrendered everything just to get a schoolhouse. They wanted to be able to have the same opportunities that anybody else might have, right? Uh, the Supreme Court of Canada in a case in 1990 called the Siwi case. So the Siwi brothers were found camped out in a provincial park in Quebec. You know, they were all getting naked and going into a sweat log. And you know how the Quebec provincial police doesn't like people to get naked and go into a sweat lodge. So they were charged as violating the park regulations where you weren't allowed to have fires. They took it to the Supreme Court. They said this scrap of paper given back to in 1762 before the Royal Proclamation, this little scrap of paper that General Murray signed gave some Hurons saying, you have the right to, you know, we're not your enemies anymore, you can pass freely and you can practice your religion. That's basically all it's in. The Supreme Court said that document is a treaty because it was signed by a competent government official and competent leaders of the Huron and it made some promises that were, you know, to last forever. So, uh, uh, and the Supreme Court said, borrowing language from the American Supreme Court, it said, treaties have to be interpreted in a liberal and generous manner. It effectively legally adopted the notion of the spirit of the treaties. Treaties have to be interpreted in a liberal and generous manner. Now, when that decision was handed down, the federal government did not suddenly change its policies and decide we're going to now start respecting the treaties in a liberal and generous manner. All the federal government has done has said basically, oh, we've always interpreted them in a liberal and generous manner and went on with business as usual. It will be up to us. It will be up to, the, you know, people in society at large to say, uh, we are all signatories to the treaty, right? I, as a non-Aboriginal person, benefit from the treaty. Signatories on my behalf sign the treaties. I am, a, therefore, a treaty signatory. Uh, we are all treaty signatories. And if Canada is going to be a country that's founded on anything that, it des that you know, deserves to be talked about, other than theft and you know, the, the theft of people's land, then we have to respect treaties in a very meaningful way. And that would mean uh, looking at the clauses, for example, around pursue your, I mean, basically, I think it would mean Aboriginal people are, would be joint managers of their traditional territory, not their reserved lands. 
Now, I was going to say one other thing. Reserve lands are given a hard knock a lot of the time, but I'll say this. Métis land rights were dealt with through individual pieces of scrip, and those individual pieces of scrip, a land title, were frequently sold. So there are some Métis communities that exist as communities in Western Canada, but many of those communities dispersed, and many of the Métis land rights were sold off. Right? Uh, however flawed reserves are, reserves have allowed intergenerational Aboriginal communities to maintain themselves as functioning communities for, the, for more than 100 years. The, the use of scrip instead of reserve lands has basically meant the Métis diaspora, the Métis have spread out. And there are a few, and they're notable, and you know we should applaud them. There are some Métis communities that have sustained themselves, but many of the Métis uh, have lost their identity as communities. They maintain pride as a Métis nation, as individuals and part of a grander thing, but they've lost that kind of that face-to-face -face community contact that First Nations communities have. Um, and I mention that because it's important to realize that that's really the ultimate goal of the Harper government. Harper's, the way Harper wants to deal with reserve lands, borrowing from Tom Flanagan, is to, is to privatize and individualize uh, reserve lands as much as he possibly can so that First Nations people end up like the Métis without communities that are intact intergenerationally who have, however pitifully small, a land base. And as long as they have that land base, they have a position from which they can argue that they should have a say over the larger land base, which is what the struggle of Kitchener Maker said the Ninawag or the Innu or, uh, you know, or the Fer uh, Fort Mackay, uh, Miccosu Cree, or many of the First Nations who've been involved with the struggles with the government. Uh, have involved. I don't know if that was a full sentence, but it sounded like a full <laughs> sentence towards the end. I tried to make it into a full sentence, even as it wasn't. I've way gone over time. Maybe I could take a couple of questions and then turn it over to the chicken. That's me. Do you have questions? No questions? I'm happy to run away. Uh, yeah. what Lester has come through here saying um, that um, as, far, as far as his research goes, the women own title to the land. Can you speak to that in any way? Well, I can speak to it in the way that I know, which is just for Anishinaabek. And I've been trying to do some of this research with Cree. So I've done some treaty research with the adhesions to Treaty 5 in northern Manitoba. Well, to Treaty 5 and Treaty 10. Um, uh, but among Anishinaabek, uh, spiritually, women have a special responsibility for water. So it's significant to me that none of the number of treaties surrender water rights and women weren't at the treaty negotiations table. So that, so that I mean, I think it gives um, a sort of a cultural and spiritual reason to make a legal claim that the number of treaties never surrendered Aboriginal water rights throughout Western Canada. So that's an argument that, uh, as far as I know, I was making before I heard other people making it, but I've heard some people from Native Women's Association have been making it. It parallels Lester's argument, but it's slightly different. Uh, and I should say, Lester uh, has, I think, a profound and very interesting case to make around sovereignty, which, uh, you know, you, obviously you could challenge this whole ball of wax. You could challenge the Royal Proclamation and all of that. I'm simply giving you the case within the terms that the Supreme Court of Canada has now largely endorsed it. And so I'm giving you a fairly straight up, the kind of legal history that they would get in law school, which with more detail, with more time, I'd give you more detail. But none of this, none of what I've said is controversial in the law school anywhere in Canada or, or for the courts to hear. If we extrapolate a bit and say that water rights haven't been surrendered, then there's uh, you know, some legal arguments to be made on both sides. Uh, but I think that, you know, there's a more profound level of argument that questions the, the sovereignty of the Canadian government, the ability of the Canadian government to even have, be able to unilaterally interpret treaties, all of that kind of stuff. So I'm leaving that aside. Anything else? I, I see one or two people still awake. No, you're all sleeping. <laughs> I have that lovely voice that just sends everybody <laughs> off into dreamland. That's fabulous. Okay, well, thank you. I really, really appreciate seeing you guys all out here tonight. That's a wonderful thing, and that's the kind of thing that uh, is the basis of any worthwhile change that we're going to see. So here's to you. <laughs> oh, a question for Peter? Yeah. Peter, there's a question at the back. Yeah. Oh, no, dealing with the government. Yep. But, uh, I'm from Quebec, actually. I don't know what you're talking about when you're talking about treaties or whatever. But anyways, the traditional government or the INAC appointed government be more stronger to fight Canada laws? Well, um, you know, it's... Uh, 
I mean, one thing I would say is, you know, every single First Nation is different. They're all in very different and their own complicated network of situations. You know, generally speaking, I endorse traditional governments for sure, but I've seen places where traditional governments uh, have almost been even uh, more, I don't know, uh, collaborators with INAC. But I will say, in Manitoba, we have a brilliant example. So in uh, Cross Lake First Nation, it's, they established their own first written law as a Cree nation. They reestablished themselves as the Pimichikamak Cree nation. Um, and Pimichikamak Cree nation is run by an elders council, youth council, women's council, and executive council. They embedded the Indian Act within it so that the government couldn't challenge it and I think have been quite successful as an alternative, traditional-based form of government, and they've been the one who've been really first in line challenging Manitoba Hydro and challenging the federal government. The former chief there, John Miswagen, once told me a, lo a lovely story that I like to repeat that's on that question. He said, uh, you know, he would phone the federal government sometimes, and he would talk to them, and they'd get into these long negotiations, and at some point, often the federal government people would say to him, well, wait a minute there, you know, we don't recognize your form of government. Eh? You understand that? We don't recognize your form of government. And John always liked to say back to them, he would say, oh, that's perfectly fine, no problem. We don't recognize your form of government either. Thanks for the question. Okay. I'm going to have to run fairly soon, but I want to see a little bit of what Chicken has to say. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, Chickadee, our, uh, our next speaker. Um, tonight is the first time I have uh, ever met Chickadee, so I, I know very little about her. All I know is um, when the organizers were, you know, we were sort of talking about what we were going to do and who we were going to ask and how we were going to set up the meeting, um, Chickadee's name came up and when it was confirmed, I saw a number of people get really excited that Chickadee was coming. So um, I'm excited because I don't know what I'm in for. Uh, I've never met her before. So, Chickadee, please uh, come, and we are uh, looking forward to what you have to share with us. I want to acknowledge uh, my ancestors, my grandfathers, my grandmothers, the ones that came before me, for I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. And um, I had a, a dream of my grandfather this morning, and uh, it, it kind of stunned me. And he came to acknowledge me in the work that I do. And. Um, I never really had a, a relationship with my grandfather on my mother's side, nor on my father's side. Mm, but I had relationships with my, my grandmothers and my, my, my great-grandmothers. And I was very fortunate to see my great-grandmothers and, and be with them. And the knowledge that they shared. I never understood a lot of things as a, as a young woman, as a young girl. My world was, was free of, of, of racism. My, my world was free to play by the waters. My world was free to play on the, in the forest, just, just like an avatar. <laughs> so I really didn't know a lot until I, I started going to school um, to understand why people were the way that they were towards me and not understanding that it was the the, the matter uh, of my skin, the, the, the brownness of my skin. And um, over time, I, I tried to understand that, um, to understand why racism played such a big part um, towards who I am as a Anishinaabe. Um, I introduced myself as um, Binesky Munikwe. That name is a thundering woman. And I also come from the clan, Makwa, which is the bear. And uh, the reason I identify myself to, to that is it's because of my ancestors. I was thinking of my, my, my great grandfather, who was uh, one of the last people on my reserve. 
um, who, who believed in our way of life. Um, he heard that the, he was one, one of the last people, and when he heard that the police and the priests were coming, he went and burnt his, his sacred items. And uh, following that, my grandfather died of alcoholism, my great grandfather. So you can see what had happened to him, devastated him because of the Indian Act and um, why it was put in place because they've seen of what it did to the, the spirit of our people and what our people were about was, was that relationship to the land. They were, they were about the respect to the land. You know, we, we, only, we only took what we, we needed, never over consumed. Only if we had to feed other, other families, which I had seen my father do. My father would hunt and fish and he would give it to the ones that didn't have a partner. Or if it was his brother who, who couldn't do it because he was sick, he would, he would give those, that, that meat, and, um, the wild meat and, and the fish. So I, I've seen a lot of things growing up. And like I say, I want to acknowledge my ancestors. And, and I go back, I go back um, 6,500 years. I'm going back to where our, our clan mother was unearthed here recently, 30 years ago, it was taken away from her, her area where she was buried, and it was a clan mother. And how we know that is because of the way that th our sacred I items were around her. There was also a grandmother that was 1,500 years old that was unheard. And she, she had a child with her, and this child had a beaver rib bracelet. So right away we said, she must be from the beaver clan. So these are the things that governed us. We were a matriarch society. And, and through all, all the treaty um, negotiations, the women weren't involved because they knew the power of the woman and they disempowered the women. Before that, they, they seen how women would sit the men would go and sit with the women in council, and they would come back with a decision whether they were going to um, uh, further the relationship with the settlers, let's just say that, and, and the treaty negotiators and makers. And so a lot of times we were dismissed as women, but this, this, these grandmothers that come forth to us, you know, through the university, they had taken our grandmothers from the place that they were buried. And you think about how wrong that is if I were to go back to your country, if I were to go back to Europe somewhere and unearth the grandmother that was 6,500 years old. I think there would be an outrage and outcry. So our grandmothers, and a lot of them still grandfathers, ancestors, are sitting in universities, are in boxes, paper boxes. So our grandmother called to us, I mean called to us, I mean, we didn't chose to say, okay, we're gonna go get them out of the university. We heard that they were, they were there, and, and we felt it in our hearts that this was wrong. And so we would decide that we wanted to go and take them out of there, and they needed to go back to where they came from. They came from the Seven Sisters area. They called Manitowabi, where the Creator sat. And, and there's many things there on that land and I've been there. My, my cousin has fasted there for many years, going on nine years now she's fasted in that land. And we talked many times and saying she must return to that area, she must return. And, and our sister, Joe and Judy, we said we, we gotta do something about this because this is wrong. We can't let her sit in, in the university, we can't let her sit in conservation, we, we have to do something. And, and so part of that preparation is, is prayer. And, and our, our people are known for prayer, and that was why the treaty and, and the Indian Act you know, was done in prayer. I guess the treaty was done in prayer, in good faith. It was a moral and legal obligation that was to be part of that, that treaty. And, and then it hasn't happened. So the way I see it is like um, the treaty is, 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 is void. Because if you make any agreements, you talk about labor agreements. If you're a teacher and you, you have an agreement you know, with the union, 
or you know, with the teacher association, whoever governments, you have an agreement. And so you sign to be part of that agreement, and, and, then, and then they break that agreement. And you could see the outcry of the teachers going out there and saying, hey, you're, you're, you're in the wrong here. You're not honoring your, your part of the agreement. So you hear the outcry from the, the teachers who are saying, you know, this is wrong. So um, as time went on, like I guess you could say that our agreements have been revised, you know, through the Indian Act that was put in place so that they would um, not have to honor the treaties. They, they've put those Indian Acts in place. And, and, it, and it's, it's lengthy and it's very oppressive. And, and a lot of it is geared towards First Nation women, us Anishinaabekwe. So if you look at some of those, those, um, those items, I guess, or acts inside the, the treaty, you think about it. Um, I, I always tell my, 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 my friends and my children, I say, you know, we're the only people who live under six laws. I said, everybody else lives under five laws. So what's wrong with that picture? There's something very wrong with that picture. So that's the Indian Act that's been put in place to annihilate us, to assimilate us, to extinguish our rights through the treaties that were put in place. And uh, these, these treaties, um, I believe my ancestors did, did this in good faith and, and foresight to see that things were happening and that they want to protect our future. And, and you know, like I said, then the Indian Act came in, made many revisions to disconnect us from our lands. You know, I'm, I'm originally from the White Med, White Mud Reserve. I bet you nobody knows it. It's called Santa Bay Reserve now. Um, I'm part of Treaty 1, which I'm very proud of, and saying I'm from Treaty 1, so I welcome you all to my, my treaty territory. And I, I don't get that, that um, right very often. I always say I'm a treaty descendant. Um, you know, because I don't want Indian Act to define who I am. I'm a Nishnabekwe, I'm a Kuchitakwe, I'm a Benesk You know, I'm, I'm originally from the White Mud Reserve, which is a big reserve if you ever look at it. And they were part of that, you know, treaty making process, unfortunately. But, you know, um, they did the best um, to their knowledge. And I'm saying to their knowledge is because they did not understand or know uh, of um, the knowledge of, of the settlers. You know, of the, of the government that was coming in to do things. One of the reasons I say this is because when the treaties originally came, they were there to protect themselves from further wars amongst the Indian people, like from the First Nations people. These, this is why the, the treaties were made. It wasn't made to take away our lands, but then I know things progressed into the government settlers, I guess, were mines and saying, okay, they're rich in land, they have this and that. And then the Indian Act decided to compartmentalize, you know, segregate us from each other. You know, like I always tell my children, you can't go with anybody from Long Plains, you can't go <laughs> with anybody from Rosa River, you can't, you know, because we were one large community. But because of the, the Indian Act, and, and also the fact that language, you know, um, every, every one of those reserves kept something alive, eh? you know. Some of, uh, like the Roseville kept the ceremonies, we kept the language, eh? and so different reserves kept something. And so we're still intact if we were to come together as a people, but because of the divide and conquer that, that continued to attack us, and because of the residential school that disconnected us from, from, from family. You think about a mother growing up without love. Um, I'm talking about my mother. My mother did 13 years, did, did 13 years. In, in, in this residential school, which I will call a prison, similar to a prison life. And so my mother um, did 13 years there. So my mother didn't know how to love. So you, you figure someone going, growing up there day in, day out, being raised by nuns who did not know how to, you know, to, to love this Indian child, this Indian woman. And then, then I talk about um, my, my, my daughter's dad, he went to residential school and he was a very violent man. And uh, I, I think about, 
you know, and him now, you know, we reconciled 20, you know, 20 years ago. And um, what he had said, um, still, it, 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 um, it breaks my heart. He said, residential school created a monster. And what residential school has done is created many monsters in our people because they enact what has done, been done to them. So when you think about it, all the things that happened to us, you know, the legacy, and to occupy us and to separate us from our lands. You know, we were land-based people. When they named those lakes, they fished in those lakes. You know, when they, they walked in the mountains, you know, when they went to pick their medicines, they, they knew where they were going. They knew what they were doing. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> Somebody found water. So my ancestors, my grandmothers and grandfathers, they already knew names of these lakes, these rivers, these streams, these mountains, these places where we had hunt and gathered. You know, I remember as a little girl, we would go fishing with my grandfathers, of all people. And it would be a family affair. We'd go out a long ways to go fishing, and it was north of, of my reserve. And then um, my, my, my grandfathers would, would get really upset at me because I would, um, I would scoop up the fish and then I'd throw them back. And um, already I had a conscience of knowing, you know, my relationship to, to those other beings. But they were upset and they said, next time you do that, you know, you give me the fish, you know, don't throw them back anymore. So they, my grandfathers would get upset with me. But that's a, a beautiful memory I had because, you know, um, this is how we lived. You know, we, we lived off the lands. We, we knew where to go, you know, to pick our medicines, to go and fish, to go hunting, you know. And, and those were part of the, the, the treaty provisions that were in place in the, in the treaties. So my father had to challenge, you know, for hunting out of season. And, and my father knew you could not hunt in spring because that's when the animals were bearing new life. He, he knew that, but because of the Indian Act, you know, they, 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 put a, they put this act in place that you couldn't hunt unless you were given, per, you were given permission. You couldn't go out of the community unless you were given permission. So um, my father would hunt, uh, and he would bring food home. And then my father would get taken away by the police because he was hunting out of season which is probably in the summer or fall or winter. But they would never hunt in the spring because they knew that was the time of the, the new life coming forth of the animals. And I remember my father going to court and, and how scary that was, you know, and uh, my father would say, this is, this is part of who I am. This is part of the treaties that were put in place for me to protect me. He would challenge that, eh? and my, my father did win. Um, so. That was um, my understanding was like the, the treaties were there to protect us, and to help us, to share this land, this land base here that all, you know, everyone else um, that we shared with. Eh? And, and our people have never forgotten, you know. You, you talk about oral history, you know, we, we, we have creation songs, we, we have songs. Um, you know, about everything that's inclusive in the universe. When we have stories, legends, you know, since the beginning of time. We have the, um, you know, what um, Tasha was talking about, the, the petroforms, petroglyphs, you know, the rock paintings. We have those things that tell us our history, you know. History has been told from a place, you know, where um, mainstream society believes, you know, that we come from Bering Straits and <laughs> They, they have theory, theories about us. Um, but just to say that, you know, our grandmother, 6,500 years old, who was buried with a buffalo skull, who was buried with shells, something that's very sacred to us, the buffalo, those shells, tell us different that, and it affirms that we've been here for a long, long time. 
and that we've been very much a matriarch society, but that's been too taken away by by history, by by man. You know, today I'm, I'm you know, I would I would call myself the head woman because my family comes to me and making decisions, spiritual decisions in the family, because I have that that lineage. You know, from my great great grandfather, also from my great great grandmother. You know, I, I have a right to to that knowledge because it's in my blood. It's inherited. And we have that blood memory. They talk about it. So we know things from our ancestors that have passed it on since you know our, our original ancestors, grandmothers, grandfathers. So our our knowledge also through time, and I challenge this, you know, is oral history. I remember talking um, 15 years ago about the protection of treaties, talking to the chiefs, and I said this in front of the chiefs too, I said, where were you 15 years ago when I was talking about the treaties? I said, protecting the treaties, I said. I said, was it because I was a woman that you weren't listening? Was it because I was grassroots that you weren't listening? No. I was aware, and our, our, our brothers and sisters were taking over offices in Toronto. We were out there doing things, trying to protect the treaties. We were, we were ahead of time, I, um, I believe you call them visionaries, that we were able to know that, that these things were coming also, what Harper's doing today in the legislation, especially around the waters, where the water is most sacred to us, you know. Without water, there's no life. You know, my, my daughter, we, we were protesting, or having a rally, whatever you want to call it, um, quite a number of years ago, probably about 14, 15 years ago. Saigin um, has a pulp mill there, and there was a um, water, and I believe Fiona was part of that. They had. Con um, um, let loose a lot of, uh, of the, the um, some, was it mercury? There was a spillage there that happened. Yeah, yeah, so there was a spillage there of contaminants that happened, and the people weren't told for 10 days. Oh, that really bothered me. So what happened was that we decided that we were going to do a protest in front of the AMC, and Fiona was part of that. and. Um, so people are saying, oh, you're protesting again. What's going on here now? You know? And we knew the, the fact that you know, if you contaminate the water, you're going to contaminate all life. You're going to contaminate the fish. You're going to contaminate the animals. You're going to contaminate human beings. And so Indian Affairs and um, the pulp mill at that time didn't tell that they had done this. The, the spillage of the contaminants into the river there. And so we, we, we protested. We, and, and I remember talking to my daughter. She was 14 at that time. I said, what are you going to do? I said, I said to her, I said, are you going to come and join us? And then she said, no, I'm going to go to school. Um, it's cultural day today. And it was Nichimakwa. It's cultural day today, she said. And I thought, OK, well. I think about this, I said, think about the water. I said, oh, without that water, there's no life, I said. And I remember this man coming to us. So I, I'll, I'll leave that, my daughter went to school, okay? So we're over there and this man comes over um, and he was the, um, the chief's right-hand man at that time. He says, well, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm, I'm here to speak for those ones that can't speak the animals, the wall, the, the fish. I said, there's four-legged. I said, how do you know somewhere down the line that, um, I said, I don't have a, um, a grandchild from here or um, a sister marries a, uh, someone from here or a nephew has a wife here. Well, it turned out all to be true. My sister's married in Seki. My son has a son from there and my nephew is married there. And this is my nephew's baby. And so he says, we can do our own. We can, we can take care of ourselves, he said. And he tried to dismiss us. He said, you can't speak for us, he said. To and I thought, we have a right to speak for that water, because that's who we are as women. 
That's part of our sacred responsibility. And so we, we protested, we took a break, we sang. And then my daughter showed up. She had made this sign. And in this sign, she said, there's no water, um, there's no land, there's no life, there's no culture. And that was from a 14 year old. And I thought, it's so profound for a little girl, 14 years old. But she knew that this was my life. So, so with that, you know, my, 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 my daughter has been um, part of the things that I do out there. And she's inherited the gifts that I have. And, uh, and she is still protecting the waters where she lives. And it's in the headwaters of uh, BC. So she's doing the work that I started many, many years ago. So with I Don't Know More, and I want to go to that, um, I want to acknowledge those ones that came before me that haven't been idle. Those ones that have been out there talking about the things that I'm talking about today and the protection of the water, the lands, the trees, you know, the minerals, all those things. You know. And speaking for Mother Earth, you know, as women, we have a different understanding to life and a different understanding in the relationship to life, a different understanding, a relationship to Mother Earth. We, we, we bear life so we know that life very intimately, how we carry that life and how that life is in that water. So we understand life different. So with I don't know more and, and the, the raising of the consciousness of, of all people, and I'm talking about the people, of my, the indigenous people, they were remembering their relationship to the spirit of the land, to the spirit of the water, to their mothers, to their grandmothers, to their grandfathers. They were remembering. This I don't know more is a spirit, the spiritual thing that is happening. It, it's not just something that, you know, I, I believe is going to blow over, you know, next year, you know, two months from now. I think, like Michael Champagne says, if you drink water, then you're idle no more. And that's from him, a young, young man. And he says, we have the responsibility as men to protect our women and to protect that water. So if you drink water, you're idle no more. And I believe that you have a responsibility too, just as much as we do in protecting this water. This water comes from Shoal Lake, Ontario. And these people have been drinking bottled water, under water, uh, boiling water advisories. While we, you know, I, I'm always in my house saying, can you uh, not run the water very long? Because this water comes from Shoal Lake. I want to respect the people of Shoal Lake and what they have to. So a lot of people think I'm, I'm pretty, um, you know, far out there because I'm telling them not to run the water very long. Their showers are limited in my house. <laughs> and that's respect to the First Nations out in Shoal Lake. And understanding this water, you know, and that responsibility I have as a woman, but I think everybody has that responsibility too, you know. And uh, I can't speak much to, to treaties other than the fact that uh, the knowledge I have of treaties is, is inherited through my grandmothers and grandfathers. I'm, I'm not much of a you know, um, chronological person that knows, you know, dates or anything like that, uh, other than what I understand sitting around. My, my, my parents said, when I was a little girl, I remember, you know, the sound of the drum, and we knew that there was other people coming, she says it, and we'd all go by the water, and we'd wait for the canoes to come in, because we knew, we knew we were having people visited, visiting us from different communities. And they, there they would come with canoes, she said. And, and then she said, and then I would see them around the fire. And I would see them singing their songs, she said. And then after residential school, I don't have any more memories, she said. And she says, how beautiful that was and how comforting it was. Having those uh, people come and our grandmothers packing up and going to meet them by the, the lake, by the water, my lake, 
Lake Manitoba. <laughs> I, always say, I always say that to my cousin. I always tease her, I said, my lake. I, because that's where, that's where I knew life, you know, good life. I, I didn't know poverty until I came to Winnipeg. I didn't know any of those things. I didn't know I was poor. You know, they, they labeled. I remember sitting on a committee and, and people were saying, well, disadvantaged, you know, doesn't have this, this, and this. And I said, holy cow, I didn't even know I was poor. <laughs> but that's the memories I have, you know, good memories. And then sitting with the elders in different territories. And I've traveled all over Turtle Island. You know, there is a story to Turtle Island, too, you know, Minica. They, um, they have stories of how this Turtle Island came to be. So I've traveled, you know, I've sat with many nations and ceremonied with them, but also heard their stories of the sacredness of their lands, their waters, their lakes, their streams, you know, some of the elements there and what it means to them, you know, what, what it, it means to their nation. So I, I got the privilege of sitting with them and hearing that, that sacred connection, you know, of knowing this is where I, I came from. This is a story, you know. You talk about, you know, the Hopi people and, and some of those things that they talk about, you know, they, they, also have, they also have prophecies. I'm gonna get into prophecies now because of I don't know more. This is prophecy that's, that I'm witnessing now, which I, which is also a spirit connected to Idle No More. And I'm gonna tell you why it's connected to, to Idle No More. You know, like, it's awakened a lot of people, but they said there, there'll be a time when the, the people will come together, you know, and you'll see this, and, and they'll be called the Rainbow Warriors. Eh? And that'll mean all nations will come together for the protection of the earth and also the waters eh? and the land. So I, I see that happening. And they also said that there'll be a time where they'll awaken the sleeping giant which is our people. They've been sleeping for a long time. They've been occupied for a long time. They've been hurt for a long time. But our young people, you know, that, that's a generation that's going to wake up our people. And that's what is happening. You see Michael Champagne. You see Jerry Daniels. You, know. you see all these young people that are so articulate and, and know of the mainstream way of thinking, but they also know of our traditional ways of thinking and being and understanding that relationship to one another, but also to the land, to the waters. So um, about a week ago, a, a, a group of uh, youth from Stalin walked to Winnipeg. As you know, that when, when one group of people stop um, walking, another group of people start walking. And uh, I believe that's part of the spirit of, of I don't know more, is that they continue to make their imprints on the land reconnect to Mother Earth in your traditional territories. So at that time, Stalin was walking into the city and there was a, a, a long line of cars following them and then there was people that went out and walked with them to bring them into the city. And so there was this one gentleman, very irate, very angry, volatile towards these young people, started swearing at them and yelling at them and giving them the, the finger and uh, so this discouraged the young people, but there was one young woman saying, keep walking, it's okay. There's a lot of other people out there that believe in what you're doing. And then they got into the city, and, and in a ways into the city, the same man that gave the finger to these kids and was swearing at them, yelling at them, had gotten into a car accident. He wasn't hurt, but his car was damaged. So you see, there is a natural law that corrects things. And I, I believe that's part of what is happening here. Is that in due course, because these things were done in ceremony, our treaties were done in ceremony, you know, in, in good faith, that we, we called upon the ancestors. And there's a time that we can be free, but there'll be a time where it's going to be corrected, which is natural law, will take its course. So I believe that's part of the natural law and part of the spirit of what, you know, the, the spirit of the treaties, you know, for as long as the river flows, for as long as the sun shines, for as long as the sweet grass grows. So they, our ancestors knew what they were doing also, you know, and, and having the creator, God, however you know, or, you know, our maker, being witness to that, 
because we have a different understanding and, and a different relationship to the lands here and knowing that our ancestors are here with us. Like my grandfather who came to me this morning, you know, it's like a TV. They say, you know, they're watching us. And I know they're there. I, I always know, like, like my, my sister Jo said today, oh, they're here. And we know they're here. You know, they're here. They, there's no coincidence that they brought you here, too. There's no coincidence that your spirits, your helpers, your angels, your ancestors brought you here to hear what I had to say, what um, Peter had to say, and what Tasha had to say. You know, this is part of the awakening also, that you have a responsibility to this, to one another, to the future, to this baby, my grandchild. Well, I say my grandchild because that's my, my, um, my sister's son's um, son. In, in our family, we say that, you know, the same blood that flows through you, flows through your nephews and nieces, so they're like your children. So we take care of them like that. And I did take care of my nephew. And so this is my, and I was thinking, why did he follow me? Why is he here? You know, like, all my pictures are at home. And it's to remember, this is who we're doing it for. You know, it's not just, and I, and I just want to say, it's not just for him. It's for all life. It's for, it's for your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. So they'll have that, this water. This clear, beautiful water. Yeah. And that's why we're fighting these legislations and, and you know, having people like Linda, um, Liz, or Liz inviting us to come talk about, you know, about idle no more. It's you being idle no more also. It's not about us. It's about all of us. Miigwech. Questions for Chickadee? You've left us speechless. I, 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 <laughs> I hope you're not in shock. <laughs> There's a question back there. You know, uh, I'm from Quebec and I'm from land where just water is abundant, okay? You know, I, when I came here, I was surprised about the water, you know, the water issue here. But when I drove here, the, 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 the fields looked like frozen lakes. And I asked questions, you know, it's like, well, they actually turn into lakes by the time spring comes along. And I said, wow, we have a lot of water. No, we don't. We get our lake, we get our water from Winnipeg into Shoal Lake. And I said, you have a big lake here. It's like, it's polluted. We can't drink it. We can't do a lot of stuff. And that's what really shocked me about Winnipeg. It's like, wow. You can say you have all this water. It's not good to drink. You have to go to Ontario to go steal water from them. Bring it halfway across the land, it's like, wow. That really surprised me, you know, just learning the interesting facts about Manitoba, you know, being from Quebec, it's like, the numbers of waters in that, are in that area, it's like, we have a lot of water, but it's damming up, and here it's gonna damn up here, there too, it's like, I don't know if that's a good idea, if these lakes are already polluted, it's gonna create a stagnant, stagnant your water, it's not moving, man. So it's natural process, Natural law will take it, you know, it's just gonna happen. So uh, I understand the job issues and all that, but I was, I was interested, you know, it's like where he's got his water from. My thoughts of water? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I do believe there, it can be reversed. I believe that waters and lakes can be healed. I, I believe in prayer and I also believe in people working you know, together and, and making this possible. You know, I, I've heard of a lake that was healed, but I can't remember what it was, but uh, I was so touched by it, you know, like, uh, we have ways, ancient ways of, of healing, healing the water, but I also think that there is modern ways also. Um, we went to a, oh, Thinkers Conference, <laughs> and they were talking about the lakes, I'm gonna pick lakes, and, um, particularly on Lake Winnipeg, they're talking about, uh, and they were talking about the hydro lines going on east, west, and in the middle, and they were they were pretty much making fun of it. And, and then he said something about um, 
I believe it was Jim Carver, the CEO of Manitoba Business Council. Um, but he said something to the effect that um, we have clean, efficient, you know, ways of, of doing things, but in any kind of development, there's never been clean, efficient ways. And I said, where is alternative, you know, energy? Where is, where is sustainable development in? We gotta look at those things in order to correct things, to make things right. So, I believe there's ways we can do things we can reverse things, you know, sustain all, all of us. Eh? As a matter of fact, there too about Turtle Island there too. She spoke about Turtle Island. I said it's wonderful because Turtle Island is part of the states in Mexico there too, you know, right in Canada. So, <laughs> and I do talk about this here on the east side with, with some of the the newcomers that come to the land. They're always curious about us, but we kind of talk about usually mentioned that they always say the Barron Strait because he talked about the Barron Strait, you know, and it's like that theory, you know, it's not plausible in no way because the fact is that America had over 5,000 pyramids here and they're all different sorts of pyramids. I said, how long does it race take to build 5,000 pyramids, you know, versus the treaty talked about in Egypt that they're so proud of, you know, it's like the over the decades of education is like, has me wondering, you know, well, who's pausing at this, you know, it's like, why not, do that? it's just the facts of how the reality of things are coming about, you know, which is... I think with everyone here and, and the knowledge that we all carry, I think that we could do great things, you know, in changing the future and also the leadership, <laughs> the so-called leadership. <laughs> That's a very hopeful thought. Thanks, Chickadee. Um, you may still have some thoughts or questions or comments that you'd like to make, but we have arrived at our um, ending point, and so I'd like to respect that. Uh, but I don't want to chase you out if you, if you still want to stay. Um, and I'd like to leave you with um, the words of Thomas King, if I can kind of remember them in, in my head. So for those of you who have come today, um, Thomas King ends his stories with saying, um, don't say that if you had heard the story, you would have lived your life differently. Well, you've heard it now. So it's up to us to make things different. Thank you.